Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you, Dr. Popovici, for the introduction. Uh, today, we're going to talk about sports injury and psychological dimension and characteristic related to it, and from the moment of getting injured until the return to play. So before starting, I want to like to highlight some important points, OK? Most of the time, when we talk about the injury, we tend to just focus on the physical dimension of injury because it's a uh, uh, dysfunctional uh, limitation in terms of physical performance. So we try more to focus on the physical rehab. But when we talk about injury, there is two important dimensions. It's physical and, uh, and psychological dimension. And most of the research that have been done, not only studying post-injury but uh, in psychology, but also uh, pre-injury, they have been shown that there is differences between injured athlete and non-injured athlete. And even with an injured athlete, there is differences in terms of emotional response according to a lot of factors. So in this um, presentation, first of all, the presentation will be divided into three parts. The first part, I'm going to try to explain if yes or no. There is uh, psychological factors that can influence the risk of getting injury. And I'm going to try to explain it through the stress injury model. Secondly, I'm going to try to talk about the typical emotional response related to uh, the fact of getting injury from the moment of getting injury until the return to play. And at the end, I'm going to go through uh, some services that us, as a sports psychologist, we are providing to the athlete to make them, um, helping them during their recovery, assisting them in terms of uh, mental issues. So uh, before, <laughs> we tend Generally, and this is obvious, and I think that it's legitimate too, because when we talk of injury, we tend to admit that physical factors are the cause number one to the risk of injury. This is right. We can give you examples like a poor tackle in football, an awkward landing in gymnastics, or just a poor mat before competing. This is normal. But through years, psychological researchers not only getting interested in post-injury models, but they try to, to figure out if there is links between psychological factors and vulnerability to the risk of getting injured. And they, and they figure out with studies and research that yes, some of the psychological factors can uh, extend and can develop risk of injury. So yes, physical factors are the primary cause of injury, but psychological factors can contribute to how. For that, I'm going to use the stress injury model. Uh, it's one of the models that uh, most of sports psychologists are using to be able to really understand how it's happening and what makes an athlete vulnerable to have an injury. It's the stress injury model is developed by Anderson and Williams in 1989 and updated in 1998. All of us, we know that stress will uh, develop, like we said, physiological changes and uh, a changement in our uh, attentional cues. This is, this is true. But how it happens, that we're going to try, I will, I'm going to try to explain you. I will take an example to schematize this, OK? Let's take, for example, an athlete. He's 100% fit in terms of physiological attributes, in terms of muscles, in terms of bones, in terms of uh, cardiovascular system. Well, uh, we expect from him that he will be uh, performant and that a good uh, body control before competing, and that he can uh, really have a good body control. OK, when this athlete is coming up in front of what we call a potential stressful situation in his sports environment, for us, a potential, sports, uh, potential stressful situation, it's any situation that we expect from the player a result. So it could be a demanding practice, it could be a demanding exercise, or it could be a crucial game. When the athlete is coming in front of this potential stressful situation, well, he's not just coming with his muscle, with his bones, with his cardiovascular system, or with his physiological attributes. He's coming with what we call as a mental package or a history, a mental history that Anderson and Williams divided into three important groups. An athlete, or any one of us, an athlete, when he is in front of a game, the first thing that he will bring with him is personality, his own personality. But be careful here. We are not talking about a type of personality because there is no study that have been shown that there is a risk, a, a link between a type of personality and the risk of injury. But we talk more about characteristics of personality, whatever the personality is, positive or negative. Let's take, for example, he can have um, anxiety, a higher anxiety level. He can be like uh, some characteristic from personality type A. He can be extremely challengeable, committed, aggressive, uh, agitated. 
uh, because he wants to, to do things uh, uh, very fast. He can have some problems in locks of control, in the fact that he is interpreting the relationship between himself and the environment, or in an internal way, anything that happened is because of him, or in an external way, anything that could happen is because of the environment. So when a players have this type of characteristic of personality, this can exasperate the stress response. Secondly, combine it, interacting or not coming to uh, alone with a history of stressor, of stressor. All of us, we are experiencing daily hustles and we are experiencing uh, and get confronted in our life to traumatic events or negative events in our life. It could be, let's say, death, divorce, separation, job loss, and it could be a simple waiting in the car, the green light before crossing, or uh, worrying about the weight, worrying about fitness. So all these, if they get accumulated uh, to an extent that the players will not be able to cope with it, and they will make him, like they, 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 he will experience this and he will keep it in his memory. And third one, interacting on roads too, the coping resources. For us, coping resources are extremely important. Coping resources is, the defense mechanism that any one of us can use to be able to attend a mental equilibrium in front of any stressors. Coping resources are extremely related to the social environment. Social environment and uh, social support from childhood and adulthood from uh, where he, can, he will learn how he will cope with stressors. So imagine, he is fit, let's say physically fit, but he has some negative characteristic of personality coming, interacting or coming alone uh, with traumatic events or daily hustles or having and having poor coping resource, what's going to happen? The first thing that's going to happen that this athlete will appraise the situation as extremely stressful and he will interpret it and evaluate it as extremely negative. And at that moment, we know that this will exasperate the stress response. I'm not going to talk about the physiology in terms of physiology terms, uh, talking about the secretion of hormones and the, what the brain is sending as a response. I'm going to just stay on the psychological uh, explanation, OK? So what's happening? All of us, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't, uh, OK. All of us know that stress response develop modification in uh, attentional cues and physiological attributes. How? For that, I'm going to use the U uh, hypothesis. The U hypothesis is a model who is talking about certain level of arousal of stress. OK, this model tends to say that anyone, especially athletes, need a minimum uh, level of stress arousal, we call it as in our vocabulary, the positive stress, to be able to achieve a performance or to do things in a better way physical activity in a better way or to perform. But if the level of arousal is too high or if the level of arousal is too little at that moment, he will, this will conduct directly or bad performance or risk of injury. How? Okay, imagine that he evaluated negatively and this is exasperate the stress response. What's gonna happen? Or the athlete will be on a higher level of arousal at that moment we are talking about a higher level of body activation as a psychologist, that's what we call it sometimes. And this will uh, develop muscle tension, acceleration in heart breath, acceleration in cardiovascular system. Well, this is, will include physiological changes and the players he will lose easily focus, refocus, he will not be able to focus on details when he's playing and this is will and he will take decision faster than it should be or he will be on a little level of arousal at that moment we call it extreme relaxation body and at that moment we talk more about being more slow moving slowly not being able to um, he will focus more on detail than it should be he will take decision later and this maybe could explain why he has a poor tackle in football when he's doing an awkward landing in gymnastics or he was not, he's not just motivated to do a warm up before competing. So that's what I wanted really to, to explain you that, okay, physical factors are the factors number one that can cause injury, but we have to go through this a little bit and <coughs> figure out why and how the physical factor get uh, developed, okay? So when the injury comes, Let's say that the athlete, he get injury, he will directly leave and experience three stages of emotional response. First of all, he will respond to the injury, just the moment that he would get injured. He will respond emotionally to recovery and rehabilitation. And then he will respond to the return to play and termination or termination of career. And 
in these three type of stages, he will respond in three ways. He will respond emotionally, uh, first cognitively, affectively, and behaviorally. This type of response, I'm going to talk about it later. Okay, so, but first, when the athlete is injured, there is three ways, three category of emotional or uh, uh, reaction, emotional response or reaction to be of being injured. There is what we call the category of injury relevant information processing. And at that moment, we're going to face an athlete who will, free, who will focus more on the injury itself. He will, uh, and the extent of the negative and convenience effect of the injury. And we, he will keep asking questions about how the injury occurred. So his coping resources will be more directed in the injury itself. The second one, and which will it's most important for us, and that's what we're going to talk about, is emotional and fever and reactive behavior. We're going to be face an athlete with a variety of emotional disorganization, a mood disturbance, uh, no compliance to rehabilitation. Well, this is what we're going to talk about later. And finally, positive outlook and coping, an athlete who has a good coping resources. He recognizes the fact of being injured. He recognizes the feasibility of injury and rehabilitation, and he's committed um, to recovery and to find solution and plans to be able to return faster as fast as, as he can to the game. So as I said, we're going to focus on this second category. Okay, so before injury. Injury, he has okay uh, physical definition in terms of physical limitation and all this. But injury too, it's very painful for an athlete. It's dysfunctional, dysfunctional and it is unexpected. For us, sports psychologists, when we talk about injury in our vocabulary, for us, injury or for an athlete, when he gets injury, it's a trauma. Because a traumatic event, it's too unexpected, it's very painful, and it makes the person dysfunctional. But it's worse than that because it's a traumatic event of the loss of how the person can value himself as a person. Why? Because a big part for a long term, a big part of the identity of the players is being players. And he's recognized from people as being a sportsman. And he's committed to that. So imagine if he's losing that in an expected way, what is happening that he's going to lose a big part of his identity. At that moment, we start to talk about the model of the loss. And normally, all athletes in this category, they experience the same emotional reaction to the loss. But the ease and the speed of how they jump from an emotional reaction to another one and how they cross the emotional reaction are totally different because individual differences and all the background behind. So knowing exactly how an athlete feels about his injury is extremely important because it will help us to know how to deal with him during his recovery uh, process. For that, we know that from the moment that an athlete gets injury, there is a variety of emotional disorganization. And as a sports psychologist, to be able to detect the quality of emotional adjustment according to the injury, we tend to use the stage model of Kobler-Ross. Kobler-Ross is a psychologist. He worked on death and illness. And she spoke about the model of grief, how people can cope with grieving and with illness, severe illness. And we tend to borrow this model from her from a long period because he has similar thinking than injury loss. The model of uh, stage model of emotional reaction is divided into five emotional reactions: shock, denial, anger, depression, dialogue, bargaining, and acceptance. Well, I will go first through a video. He's a football American player, soccer uh, football American player. He gets a knee injury and he gets interviewed just. Uh, the time after he gets injury uh, to talk about his uh, experience with the injury. So what I did is I cut it, some statement of what he did and pasted it according to the emotional reaction that he was expressing. And then I will, get, I will explain you better what is it exactly, okay? So we're gonna start with shock and denial. <coughs> Hope that it's working. No, it's not. Jim? You are hearing the video? No, there is no sound, huh? I got a twist on it. I didn't, IT I didn't twist. Help. I didn't, didn't have a weird plan or miss, okay. you know, I didn't slip, anything like that. It's just that I was running. Maybe I'm going to start, huh? Uh, because, okay. 
it was really like a freak accident kind of. Um, uh, no one hit me. I didn't make, they say a lot of times when you tear your ACL, you have a weird cut or you have a weird plant and then you kind of twist on it. I didn't cut and twist. I didn't didn't have a weird plant or miss, you know, I didn't slip, anything like that. It's just that I was running towards the sideline. Uh, Rico made the tackle and I saw in the film, I kind of planted to go towards him, but it wasn't anything awkward looking. And I just, I felt on um, the bottom of my knee kind of shift. I've never felt anything like that. I've never really, you know, a lot of people talk about knee injuries and stuff like that. I've never had anything like that. Okay. When we talk about shock, shock and denial, we are not just going directly to the shock and denial like we know about shock and denial. It's more about confusion, about the fact of not knowing exactly what is happening and is uh, a way of unbelief. He doesn't realize the players that he really get injured and he's asking himself how he could be injured and how it, it happens to him. So it's one of the emotional reaction of unbelief and uh, not realizing exactly what is happening to him. Most it's about confusion, okay? So the second one, unfortunately, I didn't figure out a, a statement. It's about anger. Maybe we're gonna find some statement in the other videos talking about anger, but anger is frustration. When a player is injured, he tends to say, why me, why it's happening to me? It's my fault because I get injury. It's the fault of my colleague, it's the fault of the coach. So here he will start to be extremely anxious, extremely anger, blaming himself, blaming the others, and he will be on the aggressive uh, attitude. Uh, the third one is so depression and really detachment. Hard watching practice, I, I wrote down a couple. No, I, I broke my leg my freshman year. Um, but uh, that was really easy, well, what I've been tol told of compared to this. So um, you know, I've been praying about it a lot. And you know, it's been rough, like I said, these past couple of days. I'm just spent a lot of time thinking about it. I've cried a lot. Um, but, you know, I'm ready. Okay. Here, uh, when he recognized that he's injured, and when he recognized that your injury is extremely severe, that he should stop, especially if he's in the middle of the season, that he's going to be in, in some way uh, uh, far from his teammates, that he couldn't be separated from the team for a period, that maybe he's going to come back now if surgery is needed, if there is complication of surgery. At that moment, he will feel more depressed because he will feel that he's limited in terms of physical, limited in terms of uh, doing what he's no, what, what the only thing that he knows to do, and then he will more... Uh, uh, express symptoms of isolation, withdrawal, um, no commitment, and all these things. Dialogue and bargaining. You know, I, I broke my leg my freshman year, um, but uh, that was really easy. Well, what I've been tol told of compared to this, so, um, you know, like I said, this is just uh, a test. Um, just, I'm a big believer in um, everything happens for a reason, and I think just uh, the Lord made this happen for a reason. Um, you know, I'm gonna delight in this trial. Just like James chapter one says, and I want to get better because it's going to make my perseverance better. Okay. Dialogue and bargaining is when an athlete is trying to tell a story, his story. And he's trying to figure out a way and an explanation to what's happening to him. Maybe he will say it's because it's my destiny, maybe because it's God. So he will try to figure out ways to give an explanation to what's happening to him because it will help him to get over this. So from the moment that he will start to realize that maybe this is his destiny, maybe this is because of God or other factors, this is, will help him to continue. And he will negotiate, and he will start the negotiation process. I will explain then after. And finally, acceptance. This is meant to happen. This is, this is part of my future. And um, it's just another mountain to climb. Um, I'm just looking at it as another obstacle. Um, I've been through a lot, and this is probably the biggest one I've been through to get this far and kind of have a setback. So I left messages like it's just it showed me how much people love me, and I have a lot of people behind me. And so you know I've I've been home this week. My my mom, my beautiful mother back there, she she's embarrassed, <laughs> but she's been she's been taking care of me, and uh, um, she's been awesome. She's been uh, making me food every night. So it's it's nice to have <laughs> that that. Uh, being at home. Um, the past couple of days, like I said, I've been down and he's been there to encourage me. I don't think it, it's anything great or necessarily amazing that I've done. Um, the Lord's really blessed me with the opportunity that I've had and um, the situations that I've been put in. I've just tried to work as hard as I can and um, I, I've just tried to be prepared for those opportunities. So, um, the, I mean, I've just been blessed, extremely blessed with the people around me. 
okay, acceptance in when he's realizing that yes, he's injured and if he's not cooperating, he will not get back. And so he will try to figure out new plans. He will look for social support. He will look for advices from people to help him to cope well with the situation, okay? So, but the amazing things in this that I cut and paste the dialogues. Why? Because he wasn't telling his emotional reaction in a, um, in a linear process, in a linear well. Sometimes he was talking about deny and then he was jumping about uh, depression and then he was coming back to deny and then he was talking about acceptance. So the amazing thing in this process that he is uh, ad admitting that emotional reaction in this model are not li linear but they are cyclical and they can repeat itself according and based on individuals and daily experiences. Sometimes for a one consultation session or for a physiotherapy session, you can in one hour find at least with all his uh, five emotional reactions. He can be on denial, after in shock, in depression, acceptance, and you will say, what is happening with an athlete? Well, he's just leaving this emotional reaction normally. They are a normal reaction, uh, emotional reaction that happened to any athlete. They are not mental sickness. This could be happened in one hour, in a week, in one month, in one year. It depends on his, uh, on, depends on his daily experiences and weekly experiences during the recovery. So researchers, they went more than through, they went more in this process trying to studying if the affective cycling of emotional react can go with the chronology of injury and figure out that from the moment that an athlete gets injured, a decrease and uh, the denial and distress they are at their peak. And uh, at that moment of the immediate post-injury, we will face athletes with uh, emotional disorganization and a realistic statement like he will minimize the injury, he will talk about the faster uh, the recovery and the fast coming back to play. And when, for example, if surgery is needed, he will be in an uncertainly uh, statement, he will doubt, he will be anxious, he will start to feel more frustration and all this. When surgery is recommended and during the inpatient period or when he will start his rehabilitation, and because he is physically limited, he will feel that he's losing his self-worth. So during the inpatient period or when the rehabilitation starts in the early post-operative uh, uh, injury, so he will feel physically limited. And at that point, he will start moments, he will start to lose his self-control. And when he will start to lose his self-control, he will feel dependent too to the others because he cannot move, he cannot do things by himself and he will start to develop depression. And especially if there is complication of surgery and with the pain and uh, all the facts of being in the hospital, coming every day, doing the same things, well, he will be, he can uh, uh, have and express emotional reaction of depression. After, when the rehabilitation start to take more place, the athlete will feel that he is more physically uh, in control, so his self-control will come back. Uh, and his self-esteem too will start to progress and at that moment he will start to negotiate, he will start to tell his own story, he will start to find uh, an explanation of what is happening to him because this will help him to continue and he will start to negotiate with the physiotherapist because maybe he will ask for, I would like to do this exercise for a week and not, if I can do it in a week it will help me more to come back because he is very hurry to go outside and play with the ball with the fitness. So, so he will start more in the negotiation system with the physiotherapist and at the end when he starts his fitness, when he will start to come back to play, all this deny, this distress, depression, bargaining will give place to a good self-esteem. He will be more motivated. He will feel his self-esteem extremely higher and he will more uh, be ready and ready to come back to play. So uh, I just wanted to explain you this model and show you this model because it's not mental sickness or it's not a psychopathology problems that the athletes are living. If you are seeing an athlete freaking out or depressed, it's not that he has a depression or chronic depression or he's not fine. It's just that he's living a normal emotional reaction related to his injury and related to his loss. So we have really to be able to detect these to help him to have a better recovery. So, but there is a problem with this model. A lot of research have been shown that a lot of athletes, they didn't experience shock and denial and at least didn't respond in stereotype manner because a lot of individual, there is a lot of individual variation and fluctuation from an athlete to another one. Well, as a sports psychologist, we keep using this model like a detection, you know, it helps us like a reference, but we use the cognitive model. It's the same thinking than the stress injury model because cognitive model, he is assuming that uh, 
injury that uh, when the athlete um, responds to an injury, he doesn't respond, all the individuals didn't respond in the same way, and it's uh, through the evaluation and the appraisal of the injury, then emotional reaction de get developed and not through the injury itself. So um, the cognitive appraisal is the same, is influenced from situational factors and personal factors, the past history, severity of injury, social support, characteristic of personality, copying skill. When he's gonna appraise his injury, he will develop emotional reaction and then he will develop the behavioral reaction. He will start to act. So in cognitive response, the first thing that an athlete will think about and will appraise are divided in two parts. The first stage is how much is severe my injury? So he will try to evaluate the importance of what is happening to him. And the second one, what's the resource that I have or I could have that will help me to cope with the injury? From the moment that he will appraise these two components, he will develop emotional reaction. Here we're gonna more talk about negative thinking and negative cognitive appraisal because if he's fine, this is good. So negative thinking, they, are, they can be in a different ways. You can find someone who will catastrophize the things, or something who is very pessimist. Another one, he will generalize injury. It's always happening to me. Who will label himself. Uh, another one who will personalize things. I get injury because of me or because of something special. Or he will reverse fortune telling. Uh, uh, if only I hadn't decided to football. Ah, yeah, it means that if he will, he will include destiny on these things and he will always talk about luck and destiny. So from that moment, when he will appraise and will think negatively about injury, that's what's happened, he will develop emotional, negative emotion and negative behavior. Okay, so how an athlete think about injury is extremely important for us because it's helped us to detect emotional response and then detect behavior response. But we cannot see the thoughts and we cannot see emotion. What we see is behavior. For that, as a practitioner especially, uh, the non-psychologists, they see that we they can find out if there is negative behavior or not through what we call rehabilitation compliance or adherence uh, to rehabilitation. It's the behavioral response that defines the extent of which an athlete he is cooperating and he's following the recommendation uh, of uh, physio, doctors, and other practitioners. So it's through the behavior that we're going detect emotional response and then we will know what the player is thinking about the injury. For example, we have two players, they have the same injury. One of them, he will talk about his social support and he will, he will have a, a hardiness uh, type of personality, challengeful, committed, and he will try to come back as fast as he can. The second one, he will be more in pessimistic way, negative thinking, and he will say that he's ruined, halas, it's over, and all this stuff. So the emotional response that's gonna be developed for the first one, he will be more challengeful, competitive, positive, and secure about himself. The other one, he will be more frustrated, anger, depressed, or having some fears. And then he will develop behavior. He will be, or the first one will be compliant and adherent to the rehabilitation. The second one, he will have a lack of effort, withdrawal, or ag aggressive behavior. Well, he will not be compliant. So what as we, see, oh, sorry. What as we see is totally the inverse. We see the behavior, we see if he's adherent or not, and then we, we try to have an idea about his emotion to know exactly how he's thinking, okay? So that's what is really happening in terms of all the mental package, all the mental things, what happened in the mind of the athlete and how we can detect this. Uh, for us as sports psychologists, and this is the part that I talk about what is we are doing as a sports psychologist with the athletes, we know that athletes who are very pessimistic and who has some negative characteristic of being uh, pessimism and uh, neurotism, they have maladive behavior, okay? And this can result in a longer rehabilitation or incomplete recovery. For that, the first thing that we try to do is detect on pre-admission uh, the emotional negative, the negative emotional stat, knowing their direction and forces. So for that, I want to uh, thank the pre-admission team because it's facilitating our work first. And on pre-admission, we see the players for 10, 15 minutes, something like that. Sometimes it takes more longer. Or refer players from physiotherapists or from doctors if their rehabilitation is taking longer or he is not cooperating, okay? We do preliminary interview assessment to be able to help him to go from distress and figure out a good coping resources. So in pre-admission, 
we don't have time to assess, to do, a clean, uh, to do assessment like using uh, psychometric tools. We do most of the time uh, uh, primarily interview to make that lead conscious, to uh, give him some uh, indication, give him knowledge, and to prevent, to do prevention. So we first thing that we start to talk about him is to make him very conscious about the severity of his injury first. We try to explain him that the surgery is extremely important. We try to show to, to, to really know that if he has he knows all the details of surgery and needs. And finally, to explain him that rehabilitation is extremely important, especially during the inpatient period, because it's their assumption, ascension after when they go downstairs and they work with the team downstairs. We figure out that most of the players, they think that surgery is uh, like magic. If he gets surgery, he, he, will, uh, he will recover it soon. And they, they didn't give a value to rehabilitation sometimes. So this is, is one of the important things that we are doing in pre-admission is making them realizing that surgery, OK, it's extremely important, but rehabilitation is very important too. And without rehabilitation, they will not recover. We do prevention education. We explain them what mental factors can happen and what mental symptoms can show up during the inpatient period and how to be able to cope with them to facilitate the works for the physiotherapist and the nurses. So like this, the inpatient will be ready, engaged, conscious, operational, realistic about his uh, uh, injury and surgery, effective and responsible. And when he go to rehabilitation, what we do? Most of the time in rehabilitation, we are facing athletes in depression and bargaining. Most of the patients that they send us uh, refer us uh, in their rehabilitation. Sometimes we can find people in anger, anxiety, frustration. We work, but most of the time we are more confronted to people with depression. So what we do? The first thing that we try to do is to screen if they are compliant or not. Uh, if they are not, we try to aware them that they are not compliant to and adherent to the rehabilitation. We try to explain them why they are not adherent in terms of a mental dimension because of some mental issues that happen to them. And we try to work with them and give them the good coping resources through mental techniques. So as I said, we do assessment. We have some tools that we do assessment with. Uh, we do, uh, first of all, we do prevention, education, and social support. OK. We cannot do this alone. So we need a total teamwork because we have first to do give the sufficient information to the athlete, because more he have details about his rehabilitation, his surgery, all he thinks this will decrease his anxiety. More he knows about himself, and more he will feel confident, and he will know what is his, the steps that he's doing later. After that, we help him to cope with his uh, isolation. A player, when he's injured, his teammate, uh, they put him in a corner most of the time. So we try to explain him and to help him to realize that from the moment that he get injured, his real team now is the medical team. We try to build up links with him and relationship, and we try to make him to interacting with people from the same injury or with other injury that they are coping positively. From there, he can identify, do some positive identification from these people. And finally, we explain them that, and we show them and explain them what mental factors could interfere with their rehabilitation. In terms of mental technique, we are using what we call relaxation and breathing. OK. All of us, we know that oxygen is important for our circulatory and respiratory system. Huh? But having a proper breathing will help not only to rejuvenate the systems, but also to reduce the side effects of stress because he will have more better control of himself. So we use a different techniques of breathing. And uh, after, if the athlete he is adherent, he can do visualization or positive mental uh, healing, what we call it. Uh, this is uh, after when he gets relaxed, the players, and we will start the relaxation session and breathing session, he will more focus on his body and he will try to relax all his body. And at that moment, when he is in a period of between awareness and, and sleeping, we will try to mentally project him in a positive future. He can, for example, visualize himself doing rehabilitation in a proper way. He can project himself and playing himself coming back to play. He can focus on the uh, body, uh, on the part that get injured or that surgery have been done on it and see him healing. So this is will help him already if he's projecting mentally himself positively in the future, this is will help him to have a positive, uh, like we said, uh, a view. And it will help him more to continue in realistic life. So that's what we do in terms of mental training. We do all goal settings. 
We sit with the players, we do some session of goal setting, we build up with him smart goals, smart objective, and strategy uh, goals related to the rehabilitation and recovery, uh, short and long term. Um, and he build up strategy, we try to evaluate this uh, in terms of behaviors, healthy lifestyles, all these things. Sometimes we uh, get the help of other practitioners to do this because it will help him more to evaluate himself in a positive way and to have better self-efficacy and we, we motivated him better and, and he will have more uh, rational direction and more rational steps to follow. And finally, we do what we call a positive self-talk. We will try to change all these negative thoughts into positive tasks and into positive thoughts. We will try to make him feel, to make, to, we'll try to, to be an optimist, to learn him how to be optimistic, to focus on the process and not on the result, to focus on the rehabilitation and not on the healing after six months, to help him to separate performance and self-worth and uh, to focus on the present because he should not think about, oh, I have to come back to play in six months, oh, I have this season. He should forget all this and just leave the present moment and focus on what he's doing here in the hospital. So that's what in general we are doing and hope that you enjoyed. Thank you.